Hello, Watch Forest Focus. Nuno Espirito Santo is officially the Nottingham Forest manager after the departure of Steve Cooper yesterday. We're going to discuss that major news at the city ground and look ahead to what we might expect in the coming months in the company of a returning guest, a hat trick ball, in fact, for our guest today. The first hat trick involving Forest this season, probably, uh, in Sky Sports commentator Seb Hutchinson. Seb, good to have you back. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me back on. Busy Christmas period. Lots of games, including one of yours. Uh, yeah, it's just relentless at this time of year. True. You did the Spurs game, obviously, and we'll get your take on that. But just before, I mean, we can't start anywhere else other than the news of yesterday and then the subsequent news of this morning, entirely expected with Nuno coming in. But initially, what did you make of Steve Cooper's departure from, from a neutral's point of view? Uh, no surprise that it was coming. I think he's probably been saved by the fan support this entire time up to now. Because the way owners work in football is they're always looking up. You know, they always think they can do better. They always believe that a club can go in a certain direction. They look at other clubs and believe they want to be like them. And and therefore, if it's not happening quickly, they, they feel change is necessary. Whether it's the right thing is another matter. Um, but in this particular case, it felt like it was coming for that simple reason. And the run of form made it happen quicker I believe it, it, look let's be frank about it you know you think a year or about a year ago he probably would have gone if it wasn't for the fan support and I think the owners do care about that that they always do because there's a subtle element in any decision they make you know they don't want to annoy people too much but ultimately over time they also looking at it and thinking well we want to be like that club why is that club doing that why can't we do that what's the difference we spend this money. We need to spend. We spent all this money on players. Why aren't we seeing the results? It can be very simple when you look at it from the outside. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're overly ambitious as a football club? I know the owners targeting top ten, and periodically you come on through the season. I was talking top twelve, and now I very gladly take seventeenth and another crack down. at it next season. <laughs> what, I mean, have we got a bit carried away. It's crazy because I think the last time we spoke you know, was off the back of that Villa win, which must seem yeah. like years ago now. Mm. And even the thought at that point wasn't, you weren't really looking over your shoulder at that point. You were thinking, well, actually, can we get in that mid-table mix? Can we maybe even threaten the outer European places? And I think that that belief, of, well, certainly your European belief is a long, you know, distant dream at this point in time. You know, I think every Forest fan would agree with that. Um and it's become this situation where people are genuinely are worried now, looking over the shoulder and and the form of certain teams. You know, we think to yourself at that point in time, Bournemouth, there was a suggestion that they would be dragged into the mix and their form recently has been fantastic. And the points deduction to Everton, you thought, well, actually, hold on, that's going to help Forrest out again. But again, Everton's form is the best in the league. So you're at the point where maybe it felt right at the start of the season was, are we better than three teams that have come up? I still think Forest are. You yeah. know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat that and make a difference. I don't think there should be any concern about that. But there was a situation, having lost to Spurs, where if Luton had had won the game that was of course postponed, um, they would have only been a couple of points behind. And <laughs> anybody knows once you're in that sort of range, nobody's sitting comfortably at that point. Now you asked about ambition. I think every club that enters the Premier League has to have in the back of their mind, where are we going? What's our what's our long-term plan in the Premier League? If it's to think we're going to, all we need to do is survive every season for the next 10 seasons. If fans are told that, does any fan want to be told that? Maybe a chair, mm -hmm. you know, might think that. And I think all that matters is staying in the league. And of course, most of them do believe that. The most important thing is do not get relegated. And if there's any threat to that, and we have to do something about it. Crystal Palace are a good example. Happened with Vieira last season, who the owner liked, Patrick Vieira. He brought him in for a reason. But they went on that run, a run of very difficult fixtures, it must be said. And then he saw a friendlier set of fixtures. He thought, I have to make a move now. We cannot go down. You know, we can't financially cope with this. And so in this particular situation, I think with Forrest, I think they... Right now, the owner is probably thinking, right now he's thinking, we cannot be sucked into a relegation spot. But I, I guaranteed a couple of months ago, he's probably thinking, oh, we can move up the table. We've signed these players. 
you don't sign the players that Forest have signed just to keep you in the division. You sign them because you want to finish above Brentford, above Fulham, above Everton, you know, threatening Brighton. That's the next aim. That's how that's mm-hmm. how they'll be thinking. And then and then once the, if they get to that point, they'll, they'll be thinking, right, now we're after Villa. Now we're after Spurs. And that's just how these owners think. They will be thinking that way. Where do you think it's gone wrong? Because obviously, you know, like you say, you're on after Villa. I saw you at West Ham, so you obviously did that game where I thought we played well and really shot ourselves in both feet. We all, we've had a lot of good performances, but it really cascaded from Everton. Everton and Fulham were just disasters, and then we recovered to an extent with, you know, at Wolves and Spurs with, you know, back to the old guard to an extent. It was a real catastrophic collapse in a way. How I guess you didn't see it coming, and why do you think it happened? Mm. I didn't see Forrest going on this run, you know, not winning games. That I didn't see that coming. I thought they they would struggle for consistency because it's a squad that struggles for consistency. We know this. There are too many players in the squad for a manager to work with. That's Frank. And I think that's the biggest issue that Steve Cooper has had. Too many players. You know, managers want to have they want to have depth to their squad, but they want to have a core group that they can work with. You know, you look at the you know, epitome of it, which would be Guardiola. He's got fantastic starting eleven, and he's got a fantastic bench. Beyond that, there's not many op- there's not many players who are sitting outside of that who think, oh, I, well, I haven't seen them for a couple of weeks. They should be involved. Forest have got loads of players like that. I mean, Omar Bamadeli. Every week, I'm, every time I do a Forest game, I'm thinking, um, is he involved? Is he getting involved in this? Signing? Why has he come here? What's the point? And he's not the only one. Players that are left out of squads. Last season, I remember when I was doing Forest games and thinking, oh, is this player, oh, is Cookie's he involved in the squad? Um, has he been registered? You're worrying about players that have been even registered for a club that isn't even in Europe. That was always a big thing. That I, I do for my prep, I've got almost like a database for every team. And Forests and Chelsea's, must be said, are the busiest in terms of mm. the number of players I've got on my sheet. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And sometimes even players that have been let go from Forest, I think, have they actually let them go? Are they going to come back anytime soon? Have they got some sort of agreement with this club that they're going to bring them back? The, the turnover is extraordinary. And then you have players who have been, might be seen as fixtures in the squad, like a Joe Worrell, and there's doubts about them and where they fit into the club now. And these stories start to come out when a manager's under pressure, when you start to see these leaks and, and players being unhappy, or players not doing this and players not doing that, and and who's the best 11 and all this sort of stuff. And you, you feel like that, that time is coming where, where the manager's time is coming to an end. Does that mean it's now all of a sudden, right, all those problems are going to go away? Well, some of them will go away because of the nature of it, because you can't just start moaning straight away when a manager comes in. That doesn't look good on the individual. So that might come back in time. We'll see those stories resurface again. But decisions are going to have to be made about certain players, especially January now, which is probably why, again, the ownership have gone down this route of changing managers at this point in time. So he can have some games before the window opens to evaluate his squad. He's got a lot of players to evaluate and to make decisions because, let's be honest, they'll go back in the market again in January, won't they? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, well, they we need to clear, have a big clear out, certainly. I don't, please yeah. don't buy too many players. That's a conversation <laughs> for another day. Um, that was a good point. I'm not talking about that about City. Like, they'll pluck out a Rico Lewis or an Oscar Bob, who I'd never even heard of at yeah. the start of the season, and we don't. You know, we've nothing like that. So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, One more on Cooper before we move on to Nuno uh, and a couple of points you made there. I mean, do you think the players let him down to an extent? Obviously, that Fulham game was terrible. Or does Cooper have to look at himself? Because we we chopped and changed the team so much. We had five captains. He he made some strange subs. But is that just a byproduct of, as you say, of having so many players it can cloud the mind as well? That's exactly what it is. That's why he changed, I think it was seven changes for the Wolves game. Because again, he thought, right, this is not working. <laughs> I'll make a wholesale change. How many other managers in the Premier League would have done that? It's not very common. I think this season, I think only Brighton have made more changes to their starting eleven than Forest. And Brighton, again, it's, it's a different thing going on there. You know, De mm. still probably trying to f- 
way he manages his squad is different. It's not the same problem that Steve Cooper has. So I would say Steve Cooper probably, of all the signings, there's probably only a handful that he actually wanted. Because as we know, Steve Cooper, just based off players he brought in in the championship and also time at Swansea and his links to youth football in this country, the players he'd be looking at and be interested in are not the sort of players who would come into the club. Um, so that that's a big part of it. He didn't, he had too many players and the players that were coming in weren't his choices, essentially. You know, mm -hmm. now some, the other side of the argument would be, well, you the manager, you manage the players that we buy. You know, you go and do that. You know, we buy these players, you manage them. That's what we pay you to do type thing. But let's make it simple. You know, you want, you want to give the manager an element of control over the players he brings in. Again, let's use another club as an example. You feel like with Arsenal that Arteta has a strong say, the strongest say on who comes into the club. Now, he might be offered players, as every club is offered players, that's a fact, by agencies. But he'll have the say on the player he wants to come in. I think any successful setup, look, Guardiola must be, 100%. Klopp must be. You know, they'll have a they have players that they want. I don't think Cooper ever had that. There might be one or two players he's been able to say. Maybe let's look back and think of the signings at the start of last season. My guess would be, do you think the Huddersfield players were a Cooper choice or were they the Maranakis choice? What I mean, what do you think? For example, oh, they were they were they were a Cooper choice. Mortgage yeah, White, exactly. Nico Williams, young yeah. younger British players. Then you get to like yes. Emmanuel Dennis. Obviously not a Cooper choice, and you can see where he is now. Cooper made some dud recommendations as well, but I know people throw Chris Wood at him and John Joe Shelby. I think they were born a little bit out of desperation in January. We had a lot of injuries at the time. I think people forget that, but they they haven't worked. Andre Ayew hasn't worked as well. So that's another problem with Forest. There's like three recruitment teams. That you, you don't seem to get that at, at other clubs. There's the owner's camp, the manager's camp. Uh, Ross Wilson and George Sirianis' camp. It feels like there's too much muddle, muddle thinking, and too much chaos. If I think, I mean, to me, and you might agree, you might disagree. It feels like this has been an opportunity for a bit of a reset, and we've got to really streamline the football club, which starts with streamlining the squad. Because Nuno's success at Wolves, from reading up on him, was based on this very tight core group, mostly yes. of Portuguese players, but also Jimenez, and we probably need to get that model in place quickly to give Nuno his best chance of succeeding. I mean, you've got Nuno Tavares on loan, so you've got a start. You've got one... <laughs> it's, well, we've got a few build, Brazilians build a, who speak build a, Portuguese. Build a, yeah. a Portuguese group. I think it's going a Portuguese group. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll put the Brazilians in there as well. But yeah, he's, he's clearly got a lot of work to do. But yeah, I think to finish on Steve Cooper, he's, he's a popular figure. He's a really nice guy, which I think I think counts a lot in this sort of thing. When a, when a club loses its manager the supporters straight away their first thought i think is what was the personality of the manager did i did i like them or not and that's exactly i think with steve cooper there's a general feeling amongst forest fans that they quite liked him but they rode a wave with him as well it was a it was for nottingham forest fans and of course i can only paraphrase really as not being a forest fan but even so there's a nostalgia about them being back in the Premier League because of the time they were before. The timeout was so long. And that ride of being bottom of the championship and Cooper taking you there through to the Premier League again, bringing you back to where you believe you belong. That's a special thing. You know, that's a, it's, a, it's a special emotion, a special tie. And supporters don't forget that quickly. And I think for Steve Cooper, that will never be forgotten. Um, in the minds of Forest supporters, you know, they'll always remember he was the manager that took us there, which is fascinating because in a time, in a time where manager was coming in and out the door, he became the manager that was there for the longest period of time. He's a manager after a hundred games with a better record than Brian Clough. He's got that, you know, he's a little after a hundred games, you know, he has these things. So whatever happens, I think he'll always be thought of, fondly for Forrest because the, I think Forest fans will understand when he left they weren't in the relegation zone they weren't actually let's be honest they're not quite in a position where they're under threat of relegation he's got a bloated squad that have had some good moments in the Premier League have had some big wins in the Premier League 
And even not that long ago, that win over Aston Villa, look at Villa now. And that was one of their worst performances. And that was the way Forrest played that day. And I thought playing Spurs, they tried to replicate that because we know Spurs play a similar fashion with the high line and everything else. And I think you tried to replicate that. But the difference was the players available were different to this time round. And it, I think it was a problem. I don't, that was a problem for Forrest because they got themselves in some good areas. But anyway. Yeah, we just had no, no quality at either six-yard box. We might come back to that. Um, but one more on Cooper very quickly. Where's his next job? Uh, is he a, another crack at the Premier League for you? Yes, I think so. <laughs> yes, I think <laughs> Not so. specifically. I mean, I think it'll be... Yeah, Palace, yeah, I like, but, I like, yeah. I like that. Yeah, I would say, look, everybody's saying Crystal Palace. Uh, it makes sense for so many reasons. You can't take Roy out of the job because Roy's in the job. Yeah. But we know that with Steve Parrish and what he wants to do with with Crystal Palace is he wants them to be a place where when we look at the talent produced in England, the hotbed really is South London. And he wants to be a place, the club where young talent in that part of the world decides, we'll go to Palace. Palace is our first step. Palace is where we'll go. We'll get an opportunity. We'll get a chance to play. And he wants a manager that will fit in with that ideal whilst at the same time staying in the Premier League that's the balance it's not just some youth team project but ideally that's how you know they invested a lot in their training facilities they want to make amendments to Selhurst Park and update things but and he'll obviously want that experience in the squad but he wants a manager to go on that wave with him he thought Vieira would be that man but it came a bit too awkward because of the position they were in the league and that that losing run so Cooper makes sense. And look, Mark Gahey is there. So <laughs> there's always got to be an under-17 World Cup winner in Steve Cooper's squad, whatever happens. That's non-negotiable. So, uh, yeah, he's got one at the uh, at Palace. So that that seems to make sense. But I think that because of the nature of the way he's conducted himself and everything else and, and what he's built in his relatively short career managing senior players is a chance to go again. Now, it might be, if it is in the Premier League, you know, we're not saying he's going to be in the mix for the Manchester United job. No, no, nowhere near. But he's built himself to a position where he will, we will see him again in the Premier League. Maybe it is Palace. Yeah, well, it makes sense. And like you saying, Gahey, Tyreek Mitchell, Elise Eneze, who they brought in. That young winger whose name I forget, who's a good player as well, who's always coming off the bench for them. Yeah, it does make sense for them. Um what about Nuno then? Like we say, he's had great success at Wolves and I can see he's sort of a continuity candidate in a way because the football he plays is built on these solid foundations, counter-attacking, pace out wide. Uh, some Wolves fan, friends of mine who I referenced on the last night's stream say the football's much better than his reputation suggests and they really enjoyed it until the last season at Wolves where it all fell apart when Jimenez got injured. Forest fans don't seem overly enthused with the, the, the appointment though. What, what do you make of it? I think they're not enthused because of what's happened recently. Aliti had his, you know, he's left his job in South Saudi Arabia quite quickly. The Spurs appointment was was short term, but there's other reasons for that. So, and obviously the way it ended at Wolves. But I think the template for Nuno, as far as Forest's interest, is the fact what he did with Wolves, getting out of the Championship into the Premier League, and very very quickly, they were a difficult opponent for both well, for most Premier League clubs, and he qualified the club for Europe. Now, if you were to swap Wolves for Forest as a template, I think that's the dream for Maranek, is to see that path happen. People come to the city ground, it's like, oh, God, we don't want to go there, beating the bigger sides. Now, we saw a bit of that last season, but the next step is he wants them to push on. And if, if Forest were in the Europa League, say, next season, you know, that would be fantastic for the plan. And he looks at Nuno and think he's a manager who's done that before. He's a manager who's, mm. who's taken Wolves from the Championship into the Premier League and into Europe. And 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 they did pretty well in Europe, actually. I think they were very unfortunate against Sevilla. So, and they, it felt like, a bit like Brighton now, it felt like when they were in Europe, they felt ready for it. 
because of the style of football they were playing, the players they had in the squad. You know, traditionally, we we saw with English clubs in European competition, in, in say, the UEFA Cup in the past, certainly during the, the post-period when clubs were banned, and we're talking 90s and 2000s, they didn't really do particularly well. We had the odd, odd, odd exception. And there was always this idea of the style going into Europe just didn't fit it. But when Wolves went in there, it just felt right. And weirdly with Brighton, it just feels right. So let's see um, if that ends up being the case with Forrest. And like I say, it'll be interesting to see what Nuno does with this squad. Because do any of us truly know what Forrest's best team is? I suppose as a Forrest fan, you sort of think you do. And I bet mm. it changes week on week. You probably thought, oh, Vlakadimos, answer to all our problems. He's going to come in and go on a long run. And not long after, changing the keeper again, Turner's back in, and he's making errors again. So, all right, do we go back to Vlakadimos or, or what, what do we do now? You, you could almost look at, I mean, I reckon every single Forest player this season has had criticism of some sort. Maybe our knees might be the exception, but that's because when a player starts to get injured, fans <laughs> make them more important. You know, they become really key players. But, you know, I've heard people doubting Gibbs White. And, and so, you look at who, who, who is a, is a nailed-on player in the team. It's hard, to, it's hard to, to gauge that and what 11 Nuno may put out. So, let's see what happens, you know, this weekend for a start. Yeah, midfield sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, you go to West Ham, Sangare has a really solid game, sets up the first goal, Dominguez before that. That, 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 they seem to fall apart for West Ham, but Dominguez, Sangari, Mangala was a good axis, and now we've got yeah. Chet Koyase, Ryan Yates, and Oral Mangala from you know the space of barely a month. So yeah, I think that sums up where we're at and perhaps where we need to get get back to ultimately. I mean, do you think yeah. this Forest squad is comparable to the Wolves one in terms they had you know they had Rui Patricio, Ruben Neves, Jean Martino, Connor Cody was an England player, yeah. Jimenez and Jota. Can Forest get near that this season? Or do they need with, some well, with the players that they have? Well, they do they well, yeah, I don't think they can, can they? Do yeah. they need recruitment over time, basically? I, I, I can't I can't answer that because I I don't I think they have a lot of good players, and you could actually say yes, they have players who potentially are of that level. But the, the difference was was that Wolves played these players week in, week out. The squad actually yeah. wasn't that big. You could name the Wolves eleven quite comfortably. Uh, can't do that with Forest. I would say when we last spoke, the Villa game, it felt like the eleven that started that game. It felt strong. You know, Carti was in form. Marilo was was doing really well. That midfield you just mentioned there, and the front three was close to being set. But mm. Owenie's injury affects that. Hudson Odoi has come back, but again, you're again mixing things up in the front line. Gibbs White felt like the player who was always going to start whatever happens, but even people have been having doubts about his role in it. But he is a player who needs to be in a set system. Now, the mm. other interesting thing was, of course, Gibbs White is back with Nuno. And <laughs> how does Nuno think about him now? Does he feel he's going to be an important player in his team? That will be interesting to see. It's um, I've, I always find those things really interesting because obviously players leave for opportunity. You know, Wolves was the club that Gibbs White came throughout but the, he just didn't play enough that's what was quite clear even during that period remember this was obviously being part of the under 17 team is seeing who was who was going to break through quickly and I felt at the time Gibbs White had the best chance because he was in a side not competing for the title and he would get a run in the Wolves team but it didn't really happen for him to the extent where they loaned him out in that final year so yes let's see what happens with him I, I, as I said, when I've seen, I saw Ryan Yates obviously starting the Tottenham game, and I thought, okay, we're back, we're we're, we're starting again here. I actually thought that Forrest were building something, but those results were so damaging for Cooper that he felt he had to make the wholesale changes for the Wolves game. They got the point, and so therefore he had to stick to that. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was only the second time he'd named an unchanged team all season from from, from off the top of my head. It was um, it was interesting that that happened, but of course, lost. Yeah, true. Gibbs White's an interesting one, isn't he? Because I don't know if he fits the system, but maybe you engineer a system where you have two number tens in behind a striker or something like that. It can be done. If the can you play? Can you play that system when you're 
looking over your shoulder in the Premier League, how many teams have the license to play a system with two eights, two tens, however you want to look at mm. it? Not not many clubs in the league are able to do it. No. But then I don't think we can play a midfield three that we played the last two games because it's too defensive. I, I mean, I, I take Kwiatkowski out personally. Not that he's done anything particularly wrong. Mm. What's your take on Yates? I was going to ask you about that. They're speaking to some <laughs> Spurs fans on Twitter. Uh, hate him. They, they don't like hate him. him. No, they yeah. Hate. Wolves fans <laughs> who I went to the game with hate him. I love him, but he's obviously got a ceiling yeah. as a footballer, I suppose. What, what's your take on him? Well, you just answered the question there. If the opposition fans don't like one of your players, they're doing something right. Aren't they? Mm. <laughs> that's the way it works. I think the rates, the the, the rates. That's, that's a Freudian slip. Uh, the Yates thing just during the Spurs game. I mean, he was charging around. He was putting his foot in. Uh, he is he is a nuisance to the opposition. I mean, that's the reason he's playing. You know, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He loves Forest through and through. It's such a that's an important connection for the supporters. The required midfield quality for a team. In the top half of the table, arguably not, but mm. Forrest aren't in the top half of the table. Cooper's looked at it and thought, I need people who are going to fight for this team to get us out of a problem here, to stop the rot. You know, if you have, to use a cliche, if you have 11 Ryan Yates, you're not going to be losing 5 0 every week. Let's say 10 Ryan Yates, because if he's in goal, you yeah, might change things. But the attitude of the player is, is, part of the reason why he's in the team. The perceived attitude, you might say, because other players will say, well, we're doing the same thing, but no one was charging around the pitch like Yates was uh, on Friday night. To the point where I think he wound up the Tottenham players enough. I think Basuma's challenge on him was a reflection of the match, really. Mm, he was yeah. clearly irritated by him, his presence. As any anybody who's played football knows, a player like that is an ir is an irritant. Somebody who's, who's always running, snapping at your heels, you know, is annoying. <laughs> and he's a classic example of that. Um, if if Yates was playing for Tottenham on Friday, the Forest fans would have hated him. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. But if mm. they're wearing your shirt, it's a different matter. Now, will Nuno play him? I'm not so sure. No, I don't. I actually don't think he will. I think he'll revert quickly back to the Sangares and the Dominguezes. I think the owner will, yeah, the owner shouldn't be a factor, but I think the owner will expect to see those players back in the side very quickly, having shelled out money for them. So yeah, I, yes. fe I fear for for Yates and um, I think he, he might start the first right. game. He might start yeah, the first yeah. game as a sort of signaler. I'm not changing things to, but going forward, it's it's unlikely based on the way Nuno wants to play. Yeah, I think so. Let's just touch on those first few games quickly. Um, Bournemouth, on paper, one of the teams that you would think, oh, they're around us, we need to beat. But if you look at the form table mm. and the football they've played as late, of late, they're, you know, they're effectively playing. They're not a top six club and they won't be there at the end of the season, but they're playing almost of that level right now. It's We can play teams at a good time and a bad time. It feels like this is like the worst time you could play Bournemouth, I think. What's, what's your take on the fixture? Yes, yes. Unfortunately for Forest, yes. I think they've 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 hit a a system where right right at the start of the season, I think they were being written off a bit. I think people thought, oh, be careful what you wish for if you change the manager, try and bring in, you know, this flash manager that you've seen doing the business in La Liga, blah, 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 blah. But they're settled now and they're playing in a way that looks like it's going to be a problem for anybody. I think teams that were able to play them towards the start of the season were will be pleased they got those games out of the way, including those fighting for the title. Because you look at it and you think, trying to think of some of the teams that have been there already. So Arsenal went there and had a dominant victory and they don't have to go there again, they'll think. But mm -hmm. Bournemouth, I mean, you don't want to be playing a team like that at this point in time. I mean, even we're in the point where even Solanke's being linked to moves in January. That's where we're at now. Because players, and that's when you know that individuals start to get noticed within the system. And you know you're doing something right. And I think for Bournemouth, you know, you look at Bournemouth and Luton, probably the two smallest clubs in the league in terms of you know infrastructure. And you look at both of them, they're doing they're they're in a position where, you know, from a forest point of view, you're looking at those two clubs and probably a little bit concerned because Luton look like they know what they are, they know what they have to do, and they're not going to deviate from that. 
and they're showing more and more signs that they can pick up results. Very unfortunate not to take something from the Arsenal game. Even their attitude in the Manchester City game, again, on another day, they might have got something. So close to beating Liverpool. They were, of course, leading the game against Bournemouth. Um, they were leading that game. Obviously, it got to 1-1 before it was finished, before it end, um, was brought to an end. They look like they're doing okay. I'm not trying to scare you here, Matt, by the way. I'm not trying to make you feel a bit like, oh, no, don't pick them up too much. But you look at Bournemouth and and they are heading, they're heading in an opposite direction to Forest at the moment. So you almost have to, you know, you, and I imagine as a supporter, at the beginning of the season, you're obviously looking at your own team, but you're also looking at the sides around you. How good are they? You know, are they going to be able to get more points than us? Blah, blah, blah. And you're looking at that Premier League table now and you're thinking, well, Sheffield United are struggling really to pick up points, but they have made a managerial change. So that in the back of your mind thinks, well, will they get a bounce from that? Burnley, again, I actually think of all the teams, they look like the team that I'm almost most worried about just going on a ridiculous losing run as it stands. I saw mm -hmm. them against Everton and I just thought they, they're doing absolutely everything possible to make life easy for Everton. Mm. Just watching it as a lame, you know, layman watching the the match on Saturday. L Luton don't do that. And Bournemouth certainly don't do that. They're not handing out freebies at the moment. Bournemouth, yeah. you know, they are tough, tough opponents. But, and it's also awkward because there will be an expectation still from a lot of supporters that Forrest should get something from this game. You know, to lose to Bournemouth is a big disappointment, even though we've seen Manchester United lose to them. And they deserved... Manchester United, I saw that game, they deserved to lose by that scoreline to Bournemouth. There's no no doubt about it. Um, could have been worse. So, trying not to feel with any positivity. If you Again, if we'd asked this after the Villa game, I'd say completely the opposite. And that's the nature of football. And that's how we have to work at this point in time. Hmm. No, I think you're right. I mean, when you look at Solanke, Tavernier, um, Cliver, it seems to come into that team, made a difference. I mean, I pay a lot of attention to that stuff, but I know not every one of the 30,000 that walks through the turnstiles is going to look at it that way. They're going to see Bournemouth, smallest club in the league, we need to win. And I don't think it's going to be like that. It might, yeah. I'll, I'll ask you one more about the, the, the first three. I'm surprised, this is a tangent, I'm surprised Company isn't under pressure for his job, seemingly. Like they just so so naive in that Everton game and so naive in general. They look like the worst team in the league right now to me. Even worse than Sheffield United. So yeah, I'm surprised. Well, maybe we're the worst well, team in the league, but yeah. Yeah, there's two schools of thought. One is that companies persisting with this way, almost trying to show other people this is the way he would play if he had really good players towards the top of the league. Yeah. This is how I would play and this would work with better players. That is true, which is why Burnley romped the championship because mm. if you have the top players in the league yes it is a very effective system um but this is a reason why the flip side of this is why sean dyche when he was burnley manager and fighting in that zone of the premier league and sam allardyce would say the same thing is that we can't play this way with the players we have at the bottom of the premier league because other teams are better players they can do this better than us so we have to find other ways to win and those other ways to win might not appeal to the bigger clubs in the league if they when it comes around to hiring a manager. So company maybe might be playing the long game in that. Now the question then lies on Burnley as a club and Alan Pace and everybody involved to think, are we accepting this? Are we just going to go back down to the championship and company's still going to be with us and we'll go again, knowing that he'll get us straight back out again and we'll just accept we cannot stay up in this division? There might be an element of that. If we change our manager, look at all the players we have up. The the players in their squad, do they have players in their squad who can maybe adapt to the system? They've got they've got a lot of young players, they've got a lot of untested players. They don't have I that was the interesting thing, looking at the the Burnley lineup and the Everton lineup from the, the match on Saturday. And I looked around both sides, and Everton had a lot of Premier League experience in that team. Mm. A lot. And even the players that had to come in because of injuries and suspensions, there's still players who've played multiple seasons in the top flight. I looked at the Burnley team, and I'm trying to think, I'm thinking about their back line. I think it was Vitinho, no Premier League experience before this season. 
Dar O'Shea, limited Premier League experience, and he's with West Brom, but again, not doing particularly well in that division at the time. Um, Bayer, the centre-back, similar. Delcroix, who is the left-back, barely played for Burnley anyway, let alone in the top flight. Um, Odebert was on the right-hand side, and Dooney up front. And then you've got players who've been at Burnley in the Brownhill and Rodriguez. You know, Brownhill player was with them when they went down. So mm. there's no signs looking at, and, and the young keeper as well, Trafford. There's no signs there. We think, are they going to be able to build on this, change the setup and stay up in the division? Who are they finishing above to stay in the division? Mm. The only standout candidate at the moment, based on form, is Nottingham Forest. <laughs> no, it's true, That's, but I don't and, think they and, will. And I break it down. They won't. They they don't. Forest have far better players, mm. far better players. So yeah. they'd have to go some to finish below Burnley from here. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Luton, Luton are the one that worry me, if anyone will. Mm. But uh, yeah, and uh, Everton did the same job on us when they came here. They they yes. they played. They they made us play their game, and the dice schooled us. Unfortunately, on that day as well. Um, just quickly on the first few games, I feel like there's this bracket of three games for Christmas, and if Nuno can get a win, yeah. it would set him up nicely. They're not the easiest games. We touched on Bournemouth. I think Man United actually a, an eminently sort of a winnable game this season. I don't think it's it's a it's not a it's a game where you can go in believing you can win. What well, what about Newcastle though? I know you commentated on them last night. They're obviously a very strong team, but every time I've seen them of late, apart from the Fulham game when they played ten men, they look dead on their feet. If the game was yes. at the city ground, would you have some optimism? Or because it's St. James's, are you feeling like we're just going to lose that one no matter what? No, no, I don't I don't think no matter what. I think there's, there's a massive difference from them this season, certainly. I think uh, they won two games away from home all season. The Sheffield United thumping and Manchester United away. They based, and then again, seeing them in the flesh last night, the second half, it was a team that looked jaded, tired, still committed to the cause, obviously. They could barely muster an attack against a Chelsea side who can be got at, and we've seen that this season. They, they couldn't really get forward in the second half, Newcastle. And they were hanging on a little bit in the sense that they weren't really going to score again. And they almost got there because Chelsea looked slightly toothless up front. Uh, if it was at the city ground... Uh, tomorrow, I'd probably be banking on a nil-nil, to be honest. But we'll, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think St James's Park is a different situation because it's that extra energy. It's simple to say, but the extra energy of that atmosphere, that crowd, that setting, and even teams going there. I think in the Champions League, it almost felt too pumped and too emotional. Mm. Again, easy to say, but it just felt that way. It just felt that way. I always say with football, football feels so much about feeling. And people can obviously bring data and stats and everything into it, but, but it's still human beings playing, still human beings watching, and people get affected by these things. And I remember the Newcastle game against um, Milan. I think it was filtering through to the stadium that PSG weren't beating Dortmund, which meant at that moment with Newcastle winning that they were through to the knockout stages. And you felt even with that information, the atmosphere changed. It was like the pressure was changed. And oh my god, all of a sudden, actually. That result stays the same way through, which means we we can't we can't uh, concede an equaliser and then they concede an equaliser. It's like well, we can't lose this game and then they lose the tension of it and the first season back in the Champions League for again a period of time. Players are human, so if people think that they're robots that just listen to instructions and they do what they're told, it just does, just doesn't work that way. And this is the thing, you know, you're playing Bournemouth on the Saturday. Who knows? It might be a day to turn it all around, the new manager bounce, all this sort of stuff. That It will be a different feeling in the stadium. What I'm not totally sure about is how behind Nuno the Forest fans are. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's probably a split, a feeling of new start. You know, anything could be better than the run of form we're on. But also, what has he done recently to justify us replacing a Cooper with him? You know, there's going to be that feeling. There's not, I don't think there's anybody who's or a majority, significant portion of supporters who are excited by Nuno's appointment. I mean, you can tell me, correct me if I'm wrong. I wouldn't imagine it feels exciting. In the same way, maybe Lopetegui would have excited some people. 
Um, I don't think there's an excitement with Nuna, but maybe there's a feeling of actually, well, he knows the league and we're on a bad run. Maybe we can sort ourselves out. Yeah, I think he's like the budget Lopetegui, isn't he? He doesn't have the CV, <laughs> but, yeah. but he's yeah, he's done he's done well. Uh, I think he'll get a good reception. I think the trouble is, obviously, that crowd was never going to turn on Cooper, but I think it could turn on another manager quite quickly, which is why I kind of emphasise the Bournemouth and United games. If we can get a home win quickly, it just buys him some time because obviously mm. very little football in January. Then we go into a pretty wretched run until we play. I think it's Luton away in March, our fixtures turn on paper. Mm. So it does feel important. Just before we wind down, I really should have done this sooner. Uh, a word for our sponsor, the Trent Navigation. Uh, if you can't get tickets for the Bournemouth game uh, and you want to get your name in the hat, the link is in the description for the competition to do so. Uh, just follow them on social media and share the post and you can get your name in to try and win tickets for Nuno's first game. And as ever, thank you for their support. That's a bit different from when you were last on. I think go out and get a sponsor to make this work. So we're very grateful for the navigation okay. support. <laughs> um, just before we finish up then, I mean, we haven't really touched on the squad uh, too much with Forrest in terms of Taiwo, the gap and the hole he leaves. Do you think if we smash it in January in the very difficult market and can bring in a striker, then as, as much as the importance for managerial appointment, if we get it right with a couple of key additions and quite a lot of key sales, and actually we could be quite well set up and we could finish okay. But if we get it all wrong and he gets off to a terrible start, it could cascade. It feels like we're on a bit of a precipice to me either way. Yeah, it's a really difficult position. I mean, like you said, you look at the fixtures that come before January opens, two home games. Just, just take the Newcastle game out of it because I think... I don't think there'd be an expectation to go to Newcastle and win the game per se. And it's almost like a, that'll be one of those games that gets slightly forgotten in all of this. In the same way, you know, when you, you know, you went to Anfield or the Emirates and Old Trafford and actually played in two of those games, played quite well. Mm. It's, but they are, I think supporters almost write them off slightly. It's like anything we get from here is a bonus. I think you look at those home games against Bournemouth and Manchester United supporters will be looking at those games and thinking these are the platform games to kick us on. Even Manchester United, that's how far they've fallen in many respects. You'll be looking at that. Then you've got, oh, hold on. Brentford. Think Blackpool. You got Blackpool? Uh, well, Blackpool yeah, we've got a cup game probably. Yeah. And then I yeah. think we've got Brent, Brentford's is Brentford the only game in that. January. Yeah. yeah. Phil, you've got Arsenal coming up as well. Yeah. So, you'll look at that and again, maybe a player starting to come in at that point, maybe it's too early. I want to see who how you're getting players out. This is going yeah. to be, which is hard at this time of year because teams have to want those players and those players have to want to go. Now, when you look at it, you're thinking players like Worrell and McKenna, are high up that list at the moment based on what's come out recently. But then you're looking to think, well, actually, you're not going to get much money, if any money, for those players, probably. Um, but it is a case of just removing, getting bodies out. Teams do that. Teams, there is the money you want to bring in, but you also just need to bring the bodies down, the number of players in the squad. It makes the general squad happier. Players feel more secure of their place in the setup. You know, a player could play in this team now and think, OK, if I don't play well, I'm out this week. But then with so many rotation, I'll probably be back in the next week because they'll mm. they'll fail and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know about team unity. I don't want to, to be fair, when I've watched Forest, I haven't got the sense that the players aren't getting on or there isn't a camaraderie between them. Um, but I do think there's so many players in this squad. Although when Montiel popped up again, when I was looking at him, I thought, oh, Blimey, there's another signing that just hasn't really, I know injuries again, but even when he was playing, he wasn't pulling up any trees. So, yeah, it's tricky. It's a real, and it's not, and January is a difficult time to do this stuff. It really is. But when you are where Forest are, it can sometimes take just one signing. It does feel like the striker is that signing, the centre forward is that signing because of Awanee's injury. I think if he'd been fit this time, you'd be in a better place. He certainly would have called, helped cause Spurs a lot more problems. I think the system, almost playing a system without a striker, 
it, it, it just doesn't work for a team like Forest. It really doesn't. I think if you're going to play a system like that, you just have to have more of the ball. Um, that it just you weren't going to hurt Spurs enough in that game, and obviously the timing of the Richarlison goal wasn't great. But I just always felt that were Forrest ever going to win that game on maybe the terms that he hoped they would do? I just I, could, I just couldn't see it. No, no. I thought we might have nicked a draw. We had we had that spell from twenty five to forty five minutes, and then you know Ilanga. Uh, I think he was offside. I mean, he was offside most of the game, but the one where he hit it at Vicario <laughs> yeah. and most of the season, like I thought you were going to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, nah, he's he's done well. He's yeah. done well, but he yeah. is he's so raw. He's not Brennan. That's what we you know. I know fans mm. think they're quite comparable, but I don't think they are personally. Not yet, but I think Alang is going to do yeah. well. But it's good signing. Yeah, yeah, it's, good signing. yeah, yeah. And Hudson Adoy is a good signing, but he looks very brittle physically and mentally to me a little bit at the moment. So. Yeah, interesting times ahead, certainly. Uh, right, I think we shall leave it there. Thanks very much to everyone who has uh, watched along. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Do give us a like and a subscribe. I'll use my uh, what was described by Prutz yesterday as my A-level project uh, video here. So if you enjoyed this, do uh, give us a like and subscribe. It all helps, uh, and we very much appreciate it. And we'll be back tomorrow with our full uh, Bournemouth preview. So do, do join us then. Seb, thank you very much. I'm not sure you filled me with a great deal of confidence, but I don't think I had it anyway. So you've not made me feel any worse. But we'll we'll see how we go. Remember, there's three there's three teams. It's just, nothing's changed from before. There are three sides who right now look more likely to go down. But yeah. are we destined to finish seventeenth. Sorry, yeah, to well, I was going to say that, right at this happen? yeah right at this point in time, you are the next you are the next team. Palace Palace are a close one. I will mm. say that, but they are, they're, they're just the sort of team you feel like at any time, like they did with City at the weekend, they're capable of results like that. That's why Palace, you always feel certain they're going to pick up points every weekend and, and a lot of time people won't even notice that they've done it. You know, they, they in the predictions thing, with the predictions league, they're always the 1-1 team without fail. Yeah. Somebody's got them drawing 1-1 somewhere. Um but everybody else has found some form. Look at Fulham have picked up some big results. Bournemouth, as we said before, Everton are flying. And you start to think, who's next? Wolves. You know, Wolves have had impressive moments in the season. Brentford, again, a side that you every weekend might be another of those 1-1 teams. Forest don't feel like a 1-1 team at the moment. They feel like a team that's going to be all or nothing. So we might see this weekend. Um, I'm trying to think of a positive right now. And the positive I am going to end with is Luton, Burnley and Sheffield United. Thank you. Thank you. And then we don't need to talk about next season when it's not Luton, Burnley and Sheffield United. We just hope we're here and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it in the summer, hopefully. Right. Uh, thanks very much to everyone who's joined us. As I say, hope you enjoyed it. In the meantime, have a good day and we shall see you tomorrow.